Hello everybody, and welcome back to the Western Sano Point of Care Ultrasound Series. My name is Katie Wiskar, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about common pitfalls in lung ultrasound. Many thanks to Dr. Robert Arnfield for all of his help with this project. Lung ultrasound is an extremely valuable tool for providers in many different settings, and there is good evidence to support its use in the diagnosis of both pleural and parenchymal diseases, as well as an undifferentiated shortness of breath. The goal of this screencast is to review some common mistakes in lung ultrasound to improve your skills and help you unlock the true potential of this diagnostic modality. Before we start, this screencast won't cover each element of lung scanning in detail. For a review, I direct you to the Western Sono screencast on lung ultrasound acquisition and image interpretation, found on the westernsono.ca site. A link to these screencasts can be found in the video description below. Next, for this screencast, we'll use the Western Sono standard lung scanning approach, which involves scanning four zones per hemithorax. First, on the anterior chest, in the midclavicular line around the second or third rib space. Second, in the anterior axillary line around the level of the nipple. Third, in the mid axillary line at the costophrenic angle. And fourth, in the posterolateral alveolar pleural syndrome point, or PLAPS found in the most posterior or dependent region, also at the costophrenic margin. In this screencast, we will cover common pitfalls in scanning technique, image interpretation, and image integration. To start off with, a brief word about probes and presets. For most of your lung scanning, either the curvilinear or the phased array probe should be used. The linear probe can be used if you are looking exclusively at the pleura, for example for pneumothorax, but otherwise will not have the depth to adequately visualize deeper lung artifacts. In terms of presets, the lung is traditionally scanned using the abdominal preset. Some newer machines may have a lung preset. However, this tends to eliminate a lot of the image manipulation that helps visualize solid organs. The lung preset may therefore be used for anterior views and differentiating A versus B lines. However, for dependent views and optimal visualization of solid organs, the abdominal preset is preferred. One common mistake with novices is inappropriate depth in their scans. In the anterior views, using excessive depth will not allow for optimal visualization of the pleura. Instead, a depth of 9 to 13 centimeters is usually adequate for the anterior chest and the anterior axillary line. This allows a good balance of pleural morphology, such as lung sliding, as well as visualization of lung artifacts, such as the A-line seen here. In your dependent views, the image on screen left depicts too little depth, while the image on screen right demonstrates too much depth with a great deal of wasted space. Your ideal depth for the dependent views will allow for visualization of the intra-abdominal organ and the diaphragm in its entirety, as well as lung coming into view, as we see here. A key principle in lung imaging is to scan perpendicular to the pleura to allow for optimal visualization of pleural morphology and lung artifacts. In this view, we can see that the pleura is not well defined and we have a non-A, non-B pattern, which is uninterpretable. This can be fixed by fanning our probe until the angle of incination is perpendicular with the pleural line. This will generate a bright hyperechoic pleural line, as well as artifacts such as the A line seen here. And just to emphasize this point, given that angle of incination is such a key principle of lung ultrasound and several terms are often used interchangeably, Fanning or tilting the probe refers to movement of the transducer along the short axis with a fixed position on the body while changing only the angle of incination, as demonstrated here. Being out of plane can also obscure pathology that may be present. In this view taken on the left side in the anterior axillary line, we don't see a very defined pleura, and we can appreciate a few B lines. However, adjusting our probe, as in this second view, lets us see a bright pleural line and allows us to appreciate the true burden of pathology that is present in this interspace. In the most dependent views, being out of plane can commonly result in the misinterpretation of a pleural effusion. For example here, we see a great deal of anechoic space which might be falsely interpreted as a large pleural effusion. However, by correcting our view and sliding our probe more posteriorly to allow us to be truly perpendicular to the pleura, we can see that this actually represents a large amount of consolidated lung with a small associated pleural effusion. Scanning the dependent views is often the most challenging. Always start by clearly identifying the diaphragm if possible, 
that will allow you to identify whether you are in abdomen or in thorax. In this view, for example, it is hard to clearly see the diaphragm, and therefore we might be uncertain as to whether we are actually scanning the abdomen as opposed to the lung. Always make sure that you are visualizing both the solid intra-abdominal organ, the liver on the right or the spleen on the left, as well as the lung above it. In this view, we are too far caudal and we don't see any lung in our view. Another common mistake is to have the lung solid organ interface obscured by a rib shadow. This is more common with a curvilinear probe due to the larger footprint and more difficulty in maneuvering it between ribs. This view shows an appropriate costophrenic window. We see liver and diaphragm screen right with lung curtaining sliding across screen left. Note that we don't see the entire diaphragm as there is no large consolidation or pleural effusion to act as an acoustic window and ultrasound beams do not travel well through aerated lung. Another common mistake made by learners is not getting posterior enough to truly visualize dependent pathology. For example, in this view, all we see are liver to screen right, as well as normal lung curtaining screen left. This might lead us to assume that this patient had no dependent pathology on this side. However, by correcting our view by sliding more posteriorly and angling our probe into the lung, we can see that in fact there is a dependent consolidation present with a small associated pleural effusion. These axial cuts from a CT scan demonstrate how a small posterior consolidation could be missed if lung ultrasound views are taken too anteriorly. The PLAPS view is particularly challenging on the left side, given that the spleen lies more superior and posterior than the liver. If you are visualizing the stomach in your PLAPS view, as demonstrated here, then your probe is too anterior. To correct this, once again slide your probe posteriorly and angle into the lung to visualize dependent pathology, which in this case is a large consolidated lung and an associated effusion. Moving on to common pitfalls with image interpretation. One common mistake made by novices is in the interpretation of pneumothorax. It is often tempting to comment on a lack of lung sliding if your image is taken with too much depth, as seen here. To optimize your image, the best thing to do is to significantly decrease your gain and depth, as shown here screen right. This highlights lung sliding and makes it much easier to spot a potential pneumothorax. Note that M mode may be used to look for a barcode sign as another means of identifying pneumothorax. However, this adds very little information beyond the 2D finding seen here and is typically not used for this purpose. Next, it is worth noting with pneumothorax that the absence of lung sliding does not necessarily rule in pneumothorax. For example, in this clip, we don't see definitive pleural sliding. However, there is pulsatile movement to the lung pleura that corresponds with cardiac activity. This is a lung pulse and also rules out pneumothorax. In addition, the presence of B-lines also effectively rules out pneumothorax. The absence of lung sliding should always be interpreted in clinical context as there are other factors which can lead to a loss of lung sliding, such as COPD or emphysema, decreased respiratory effort, or high ventilator settings. The only finding which definitively rules in pneumothorax is the presence of a lung point, as demonstrated here. Finally, when searching for lung sliding, make sure you're not scanning over a rib, as demonstrated on screen left. Ribs create a bright hyperechoic line with no movement, which can sometimes be misinterpreted as a loss of lung sliding. Next, in the interpretation of B-lines, one common mistake is to confuse B-lines with Z-lines. Z-lines, as shown here, are vertical artifacts that emanate from the pleura but do not travel the entire depth of the screen. Their exact physiologic correlate is unknown, but they are not pathological findings and should not be mistaken for B-lines. If you're ever unsure as to whether you're visualizing B-lines or Z-lines, increase your depth and focus your attention on the bottom part of your image to see if the vertical artifacts do in fact extend the entire depth of the screen. While B-lines commonly represent pulmonary edema in the setting of congestive heart failure, one key point is to recognize that there is a differential diagnosis for B-lines on lung ultrasound that includes many infectious or inflammatory etiologies. Visualization of the pleural morphology can help us make this distinction. On screen left, we can see a smooth pleural line with B-lines emanating from it, which is consistent with hydrostatic pulmonary edema in the setting of heart failure. In contrast, on screen right, we see an irregular pleural line which points to an inflammatory or infectious etiology for B-lines, such as early atypical or viral pneumonias, inflammatory lung diseases, ILDs, pulmonary hemorrhage, or ARDS. One note about commenting on pleural morphology. 
First, it should be emphasized that this is useful in the context of B-lines. In an aerated lung with A-lines only, interpretation of pleural morphology is of unclear significance. Next, in order to optimally visualize the pleura, it is worth optimizing your image by decreasing your depth to allow for better visualization of an irregular pleura, as shown on screen right. In some cases, using the linear probe to allow for better resolution of the pleura can also be helpful here. When interpreting pleural effusions, one point that is often missed by novices is the distinction between simple and complex pleural effusions. For example, on screen left, we see a simple pleural effusion without any obvious debris or complexity that would be most consistent with congestive heart failure or volume overload. In contrast, on screen right, we can see obvious fibrin stranding and debris within the pleural effusion, making it consistent with an inflammatory or infectious cause. Complex pleural effusions are seen in the setting of infection, malignancy, hemothorax, or prior chest tube insertions. In the presence of both a consolidation and a pleural effusion, a few diagnoses are possible. This may represent a primary pleural effusion with associated compressive atelectasis. However, a pneumonia with an associated paranemonic effusion is also on the differential. There are a few imaging clues that can help us make this distinction, and for more on this, I direct you to the screencast on the Western Sono site on interpretation of consolidations, a link to which can be found in the video description below. Finally, a few points for integrating your findings. First, it is important to remember that your findings may not always be actionable and to recognize what findings are normal in your patient population. For example, this lung signature demonstrating A lines anteriorly with dependent B lines and small consolidations is extremely common in bedbound patients, especially those in the ICU, and usually represents a mild amount of dependent atelectasis and edema. In contrast, in an outpatient setting, such as a GIM clinic, these findings would be abnormal and would prompt consideration of further workup to determine their underlying cause. Knowing what degree of pathology is normal in your patients is important and will help you distinguish when you do find abnormal findings. Finally, and most importantly, it is important to always integrate your POCUS findings into the patient's clinical picture. For example, this lung signature demonstrates diffuse B lines with an irregular pleural morphology, as well as dependent consolidations with small associated pleural effusions. In different clinical scenarios, this could be suggestive of different types of pathology. For example, in a patient presenting with cough and fever, this might be suggestive of multifocal pneumonia. In a patient presenting with severe pancreatitis in the ICU and a low P to F ratio, this would be in keeping with ARDS. Or in an immunosuppressed patient on methotrexate presenting with two months of shortness of breath, this could represent drug-related interstitial lung disease superimposed with an atypical or fungal pneumonia. It is key to consider your patient's entire clinical situation when putting together a differential diagnosis based on your POCUS findings. In summary, lung ultrasound can be an extremely valuable modality in several clinical settings. It is worth taking the time to generate high-quality lung ultrasound images and be aware of the common pitfalls of image generation and interpretation to allow you to fully appreciate the diagnostic potential of this modality. And always remember to be a clinician first and integrate your findings into the patient's clinical picture. That's all for today, folks. Thanks so much for joining us and happy scanning.